Coots is one of Britain's oldest banks and the choice of the kings and queens of England since George III selected the bank as his chosen provider in 1760. Alongside the late Queen Elizabeth II and the current monarch Charles, the bank attracts the rich and famous, with clients such as David Beckham, Harry Potter actor Emma Watson and rapper Stormzy all holding accounts. The bank has stringent requirements to become a customer with new clients needing to have a million pounds in investable assets be considered for the bank's services that include private banking and wealth management. Let's take a look at how Coots became the Royals Bank. Coots was founded as a private bank with the sign of the three crowns before street numbers had been invented. The three crown symbol is still used by the bank today and the company established itself in London Strand in 1692 by John Campbell, a Scottish goldsmith, originally from Lundy, a small village around 50 miles outside of Edinburgh. In addition to supplying plate and jewellery, Campbell, like other goldsmiths, offered a comprehensive banking service, discounting bills, making loans and taking deposits of coins and cash. Many of his first customers were his fellow countrymen, including his clan chief, the powerful Duke of Argyle, and members of William III's government. Many of these customers used Campbell to pay bills on their vast Scottish estates and provide coins for war. Soon after, the first regal connection for the bank began when Queen Anne commissioned Campbell to make collars and badges for the Order of the Thistle, an ancient chivalric order given in Scotland. A fellow Scot and able banker, George Middleton, was taken into partnership in 1708, having joined the company at the age of only 19, and assumed sole control upon Campbell's death in 1712. Campbell had initially tried to interest his two sons in the business, but Middleton proved more reliable and interested. George Middleton later married Campbell's daughter Mary, and quickly attracted a large aristocratic clientele. Only a few years into his tenure, the bank would go on to dominate the banking business in the Strand, with Middleton being heavily involved with the affairs of the well-known French financier John Law. Law looked to profit by setting up a new colony in Louisiana and took a large gamble by selling his shares in the new venture to nobles with the promise that he would buy the shares back in the future for a higher agreed price, netting the nobles a tidy profit. By 1719, the shares he had sold had risen from 300 livres to over 1,000, Servants sent to buy shares of their masters were themselves speculating and made themselves significant fortunes. As Law became more and more powerful, he claimed he could ruin England and Holland by breaking their banks due to his vast borrowing. However, by 1730, Middleton himself had started speculating with his own money as backers of Law's project began to sell out, leaving it on unsteady foundations. As Law battled to keep his empire afloat, Another crisis was beginning, as speculators realised how much money could be made from selling shares in adventures to the New World in the Americas. The South Sea Company was launched in 1711 with the intention of reducing England's debts after war with France and were granted a monopoly to trade in the South Seas in return for helping to repay the government's debt. The shares in the venture went stratospheric as speculators tried to make a quick fortune with many of the bank's clients selling their possessions to buy shares in the South Sea Company and their rival, named the Mississippi Company. Prices rose and fell with alarming volatility, from 172 pence per share to the impressive 510. On the other side, Law was struggling to stay afloat, with Middleton forced to take out loans to cover the vast sums that Law had borrowed and lost in his speculative gamble. Soon after, the Mississippi bubble began to burst as investors took profit from the surging prices which had reached over a thousand P per share. Law owed a great deal of money to the bank with debts of £19,000 or around four million in today's money after speculating in the stock market when the Mississippi bubble burst in 1720. In the same year, the English stock market crashed, which is recognised by historians as the world's first financial crisis. Worse though, George Middleton, through his borrowing to law, was exposed to a financial crisis in both Britain and France. The crisis hit the bank hard, with Muddleton forced to close his banking business for three years in 1720, due to the debts he carried for a number of customers who had failed in their attempts at speculation. He stopped payment temporarily during the financial crisis for around three years, and the bank was fortunate not to be liquidated. 
he kept working every day, attempting to reclaim the debts, and the bank subsequently recovered, unlike a third of London-based goldsmiths, who were forced into bankruptcy after the bursting of the bubble. He took into partnership his brother-in-law, George Campbell, in 1727, and his nephew, David Bruce, as a clerk. By this time, the business was located at 59 Strand, and was focused exclusively on banking, having abandoned the original goldsmith business, which had involved the fashioning and sale of gold and silverwares. As Middleton struggled with his health, clerks George Brassey, John Mundy and George Irons ran the business, communicating with Middleton via letter. Middleton later retired to Bath and died in 1747, with David Bruce also dying only four years later, leaving George Campbell to run the company. Thankfully, Campbell was well-liked by his customers, but unfortunately he was no businessman, causing it to run at a loss. In 1755, the iconic Coote name featured in the bank's name for the first time, following the entry into the partnership of James Coots, the son of an Edinburgh banker, upon his marriage to George Campbell's niece. The bank was now known as Campbell and & Coots, and in 1761, a year after Campbell's death, James took his younger brother, Thomas Coote, into partnership, renaming the bank James and Thomas Coots, signing a 10-year partnership. The brothers provided £12,000 of capital to the business, with 8000 coming from James and the remaining 4000 from Thomas. The brothers focused on reorganising the business, with Thomas attracting a number of wealthy clients from England and abroad to complement their mainly Scottish clientele. The most notable client Thomas captured was the account of the King of England. George III's mentor and future Prime Minister, the Earl of Bute, had been a customer of Coote's since 1742 and helped to bring in the King as a client. The brothers continued until 1775 when James retired and the business adopted the name Thomas Coote and Company. Thomas soon took in several partners, the best of whom were Edmund Antrobus, Edward Majori Banks and Coote Trotter, but the names were never included in the title of the bank. The bank flourished under Thomas' leadership, who boosted profits from £9,700 in 1775, or around £1.6 million in today's money, to £72,000 in 1821, mounting to around £8 million. Thomas is widely credited with laying down the core values and business practices of Coots. He successfully nurtured enduring relationships with the rich and powerful in the United Kingdom, including former Prime Minister William Pitt, the Duke of Wellington, famous painter Joshua Reynolds, and of course, the King of England. Thomas took on partners of high calibre, and by 1822 had shaped the once struggling business into a powerful bank with a reputation for reliability. Thomas's discreet nature, thoughtful approach and flexibility in handling customers' needs were strong factors in his success. He counted among his friends and customers many of the leading politicians, actors, diplomats and socialites of the day, ranging from the King of England to the Covent Garden cowkeeper. Many of the clients were involved in the American Wars of Independence, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars and the opening up of the East and of India. Coots developed the business further, taking over the banking house of Davison, Knoll, Templar, Middleton and Wedgwood in 1816 and attracting many new clients. When Thomas Coots died in 1822, he had increased profits by 640% and the bank was unquestionably one of the leading banks in London and acted as a banker to British and foreign royalty, as well as many important personalities. In 1840, the accounts and assets of the private bank of Hammersley, Greenwood and Brooks Bank were also acquired. When Thomas died in 1822, his estate and 50% share in the bank passed to his second wife Harriet, and the bank assumed the name Coots & Company. As senior partner, Harriet, who later became Duchess of St Albans, took an active interest in the business. She decided that the 50% share and Thomas' fortune should revert to a family member at her death. Consequently, in 1837, Angela Burdett, who at 23 was the youngest of Thomas' grandchildren, inherited the interest in a trust that included a half share in the bank. Harriet's will stipulated that Angela will take the Coote's name but forbid her from marrying any foreigner or interfering in the running of the business. After inheriting a half share in the bank, she became Britain's wealthiest woman. However, due to British law, she was unable to play a role in the bank due to women being banned from business. 
the junior partners in the firm continue to run the bank and request an extension to the building on 59 Strand as cholera ripped through London. Angela agreed to the extension, with offices being added alongside a dining room and library at her request for the clerks. In total, over £53,000 was spent on improvements between 1840 and 1873. During the Victorian era, the bank had to face new challenges in an ever-changing world. Developing industries were hungry for investment, and the new and successful joint stock banks meant fierce competition for the old established private banking houses. Coots therefore decided to become a joint stock bank. There could be little doubt that the name, reputation and personal fortune of Thomas Coots inspired confidence in the bank during his lifetime. As heir to the Coots name and fortune, Angela Burdett Coots was seen as the public face of the bank during the Victorian era. In addition, the services of the younger generations of prior partners in majority banks and anthropuses combined with the new names in the partnership of Coulthurst, Ryder and Malcolm sustained the high level of confidence enjoyed by Coots. During the 1850s, Britain enjoyed a period of great prosperity despite the difficulties in the Crimean War and the troubles in India. The partners at Coots were now making money not only through safe investments in government bonds but also through investments in building, mining and railways at home and abroad steadily growing profit from £72,000 in 1848 to £121,000 in 1861. Partners would receive a yearly salary of around £3,000 off the back of the success, significantly more than the governor of the Bank of England, who at the time earned around £400 per annum. The reserves that the bank had built up were crucial in the 1860s, as some customers lost money in the American Civil War after purchasing Confederate bonds, which became worthless when the southern states lost. The crisis of 1866 didn't help matters, as distinguished private bankers Overend and Gurney went bankrupt, but Coots continued with careful and shrewd management from the small group of partners entrusted with running the bank. In 1892, following a series of crises in the financial community, which included the Panic of 1890, where Bering's bank faced bankruptcy after a number of ill-faced investments in Argentina, a consortium of private banks that included the Rothschilds were assembled by William Lidderdale, the governor of the Bank of England, to secure the debts of bearings and save the London banking system from collapse. Coots decided to convert from a partnership to an unlimited liability company in order to reduce the risks for the Coots family being liable for money from any depositors in the bank. In 1904, the bank moved into new premises designed by McVicker Anderson at 440 Strand at the cost of around £87,000 a site which the bank still operates today. 59 Strand, the old headquarters, were left deserted except for a wiring, old, electric fan that some said sounded like Thomas Coots wailing for his former home. Ten years later, in 1914, the well-known private bank of Robarts Lubbock & Co was acquired with Coots gaining capital reserves of £500,000 and deposits and current accounts amounted to £4.1 billion. The Robarts Bank at 15 Lombard Street was renamed as a Coots branch and they also gained a seat in the Clearing House. As the First World War raged on in Europe, a number of banks, including Coots, started to employ women as cashiers to fill the void left by male employees who had been called up to fight on the Western Front. By 1919, it became apparent that Coots could not take full advantage of the post-war market or compete with larger banks so the decision was made to amalgamate with the National Provincial and Union Bank of England. There was significant scrutiny from Parliament over the merger as the banking sector had become particularly concentrated as smaller banks joined together in order to survive. Surprisingly, Coots was allowed to join the National Provincial but retained its separate identity as a prestigious private bank with its own board of directors. The bank had acquired wider contacts in the city and country through acquisitions and opened more London branches, including Park Lane, Cavendish Square, Sloane Street, Mayfair and Kensington. The first branch opened outside of London was Eton, followed by branches in Bristol, Norwich and Winchester. Soon, war broke out in 1939, with the Blitz causing significant damage to 440 Strand, with the windows of the building being smashed constantly by German bombs. Business continued as normal though, with employees braving conditions to commute to the bank. But the enforced blackouts meant that work into the late afternoon was almost impossible. 
The 1960s saw significant change in the British banking system, with banks again merging so that they could offer larger loans requested by national and multinational companies. The government realised the need for consolidation in the industry, granting mergers with far less scrutiny than previously. In 1968, Coots' owner National Provincial Bank agreed to merge with National Westminster Bank, but Coots and company continued to operate independently. The bank kept its unique identity thanks to the willingness of their directors, who were protecting family interests that had built the bank over the previous years. Customers were still greeted on arrival, with important clients signing the visitor's book with quill pens and highly polished mahogany countertops. National Westminster Bank's sprawling empire saw Coots calling consultants from McKinsey for the first time to make proposals for organising profitable growth. The report McKinsey produced showed that Coots must be profitable, uniquely serve a certain part of the market in order to survive. The changes suggested including leveraging their parent's bank when it came to economic forecasting and cost reduction techniques to, to increase profitability. In the end, Coots accepted the proposals with the potential to increase profits by 17%. Despite its old world image, the bank installed computers into their offices, putting them ahead of competitors as they entered the 1970s. Coupled with improving technology, the bank's premises were reconstructed behind the original Georgian facade designed by John Nash. The planning application was initially rejected, with the council demanding a road to be built through the site. However, the bank appealed the design and won, but it cost them over £150,000. While the work took place, Coots moved back to his old address at number 59, which was conveniently vacant. Among other things, the new office featured an indoor garden and museum that customers donated a number of different items to. Queen Elizabeth II opened the building, fittingly standing next to the statue of Thomas Coots. Against the backdrop of minor strikes, the oil crisis of 1973, and the collapse of the pound, causing a £2.3 billion bailout from the IMF, the bank navigated a turbulence. The deregulation of financial markets, known as the Big Bang, in 1986 under Margaret Thatcher's government, threw the stock market open to the masses, leading to fierce competition among financial institutions. However, falling interest rates meant that many acquired significant wealth, providing more clients for the bank. In October 1990, Coote opened subsidiaries in Geneva, the Isle of Man and Nassau, alongside NatWest, bringing a number of subsidiaries under the name of Coots & Company. This new group would provide customers with worldwide asset management and banking from over 30 offices in 13 jurisdictions. During subsequent years, a further 17 branches were opened within and outside London. Following the acquisition of NatWest Group in 2000, Royal Bank of Scotland established Coots as its private banking arm. Coots continued to grow, purchasing Bank Von Erse and C for £228 million to strengthen overseas operations and adding around $12 billion worth of assets. In more recent years, the international arm, Coots International, was sold to French asset manager UBP for an undisclosed figure believed to be five to £600 million, with the bank focusing exclusively on UK-based clients. Coots now offers services across retail banking, such as credit cards, mortgages and business lending, alongside more traditional wealth management and saving products, and continues to offer exclusive services to the wealthiest clients in the United Kingdom. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.